but how did these early terrestrial ecosystems evolve? Is this something yeah. that you, you learn about from your polar research? Oh, gosh, yeah. We learn a lot about that. And we, from other things, too, you know, other people. So here's when you think about the invasion of land, the vertebrate invasion of land, our bony ancestors, right? That's fish that evolved to walk on land, right? That's what we're thinking about. They didn't walk when they took those first steps into a barren landscape. Plants had already invaded land before our distant ancestors did. Microbes had already, you know, done the deed years before that. Um, and then invertebrates, large insects, spider-like creatures, things like that were on land already. So okay. land was already populated while fish were still confined to the aquatic realm. Land was already populated by shrubs, by tree-like things, by um, ferns, by all kinds of invertebrates, microbes, you name it. They had root systems that went in, they were forming soils for the first time. So when you think about it, plants were really changing the world well before our distant ancestors ever took the first steps on land, right? And indeed, if plants hadn't made that step, we wouldn't be here today. And so plants really were kind of creating a whole new ecosystem with a new set of opportunities for our different distant ancestors. So there's a reason why fish didn't evolve to walk on land 450 million years ago, because there was nothing quite there yet, you know? Ah. So think about that. As, so you think about the assembly of ecosystems, right? First, the plants, then the invertebrates, microbes probably well before that, and then our, and then our distant ancestors. So when you think about the environment changing, when plants come about on land, all of a sudden you have all these this photosynthesis happening in new ways, right? In new environments. You're having more oxygen in the atmosphere. That changes the world. So think about plants changing the world, literally. Um, and, but by this point, you can ask the question, well, why did our distant ancestors ever leave the water anyway? Well, when you think about what the, what's happening now, you now have this new ecosystem that's forming that has all kinds of opportunity. There's food there. There's large invertebrates. Um, you know, uh, there's no, there are no predators, yeah. no competitors. So anything that would get them out of the water where there are tons of predators and competitors, anything getting partially, even partially out of the water would be selected for over long periods of time. So we're the branch of the tree of life that kind of went for the new opportunity, but also got away from predators and competitors by this new, you know, living in this new ecosystem. And it didn't happen at once. It's not like there's like water and land. There's all kinds of interfaces between water and land. There's the shallows, there's the mud flats, there's the water bottom. You know, so these creatures were evolving to these aquatic or semi-aquatic habitats. And in that context, they evolved lots of traits so that it would later enable them to commit to land. So think about it that way. Hmm. Uh, I had considered that plants and microbes would have already invaded land, but somehow I, I didn't think at all about insects. How did they make the leap? Well, kind of the same thing. Um you know, they uh, quite literally the leap. Some of these were flying insects. Um, there was a lot, you know, so basically what they did is evolve just like they were aquatic for a long period of time. Some of like those crabs, features that were that useful sort of in aquatic ecosystems were useful for walking on land when it became, I mean, they had legs, you know, they were walking in water bottoms. They were walking in the margins of the water, but there was really no reason for them to commit to land until there were plants for them to eat, right? And then when there were plants for them to eat, more of them went out there and some of them would eat other but eat the, the, the insects that were eating the plant. And so it really is, you know, you think about how these eco ecologies are assembled. It's really comes down to what the plants are doing, you know, hmm. um, initially. Um, did the land based vertebrates though all come from maybe one species of fish that turned into a tetrapod? Good question. Um, and if you look at the, evolutionary trees we have it would seem that one group gave rise to them the question however is did that group did it happen multiple times from that group that group was widespread they're widespread from the arctic to what's today the arctic and quebec eastern europe and so forth <clears throat> did it happen independently in each of those cases from a common pool or did it happen in one pool i would think it would probably happen independently in, in multiple because they're what happens is things are set up for the changes, <laughs> for new changes. It's like the timing's right. 
They have the right anatomy. They have the right genes. And then they're living in the right ecosystem so that transition can happen quite rapidly in multiple places, which would, hmm. there's not a whole lot of evidence to support that, but that would be my guess. What I wanted to do was compare that to the insect case, though. Did they come out of just one aquatic creature or? Oh, no. No. Okay. Yeah, they came multiply. So which which kinds and which did they? Well, that I don't into? I don't know the details of the actual the Devonian ones. Yeah, so um, yeah, I have to you have to talk to an invert expert to know because that changes with <laughs> with new discoveries. Oh, okay, okay, great, yeah. And then so maybe we should talk about some of the the actual discoveries that you've made, and the two that come to mind. Well, the first one, and please correct my pronunciation and maybe explain where the name comes from but that's uh tiktalik rosea and so what is this creature and and why is it so important for understanding well, our so tiktalik is if i was to hold it in front of you the type specimen we have about 20 specimens now so it's not particularly rare it comes from the canadian arctic it comes from rocks about 375 ish million years old I was to hold the type specimen, it's about four feet long, maybe about a meter and change. Um, and what's great about it is if you look at it, you'd say it's, oh, it's like a fish. It has fins, has scales. Those fins have fin webbing, has a fish-like texture to its bones. And if you know anything about anatomy, you'd see there are fish-like bones in the skull and the shoulder and so forth. However, if you look at the shape of the head, you look at the way the bones and the skull fit together. If you look at the fact that the head can move independently of the body. And if you look inside the fin, you'll see an upper arm bone, forearm bone, even parts of a wrist. You say it's like a limbed animal, a terrestrial animal, so-called tetrapod. So it has both characteristics of both. Um, and I think that's the compelling thing about it, that it has features of both. And it tells us a bit about the sequence of changes that were necessary that happened as fish evolved to walk on land because this is a fish that's beginning to walk. It's a fish that could support its body with its appendages. Has, you can tell by the muscle scars on the shoulder and the upper arm bone and the humerus that it had massive, um, massive pectoral muscles. And it had a mobile shoulder and it had an elbow that could bend like this, you know. So uh, it was clearly an animal that could, could, could support itself with its body and even walk brace itself with its fins and a current, you name it, all that. And then, um, and but we didn't find it by accident, right? That's the other part of the story. That is, we predicted that we would find such a creature in the Canadian Arctic based on a knowledge of age, stratigraphy, and a knowledge of um, the kind of rock that we have to look at. We looked at, the, you know, delta systems. We looked at rivers and streams. And bingo, there it was. Hmm. But it and took then, us six years. It wasn't quite a bingo. It was a bingo <laughs> over six years. So stretch mm -hmm. that out. And then it looks like you also discovered one of its relatives. Uh, again, correct me. Chikitanya, is that Almost. right? Kikitanya. Kikitanya, okay. Yeah, Kikitanya is a close relative found nearby Tiktaalik. Found it a few years back. Described it just last year. But <clears throat> what Kikitanya is, it's a smaller version of Tiktaalik but it's not aquatic. Now you could say, okay, well, yeah, maybe it's primitive. Maybe Kikitania is just primitively aquatic because you had to transition from fish to tetrapod. Aquatic things go to terrestrial things. But that's not the case. Kikitania is actually very derived. So it's secondarily aquatic. So it, its ancestor was a creature that was already kind of making steps to walk on land, but it's a creature that, you know, did a U-turn and went back, evolutionary U-turn and went back in the water. <coughs> um, and it's specialized for life and paddling and swimming and things like that, um, which is fascinating. Um, so you had, so that sort of beats the notion that, you know, there's a continual train of progress and evolution, which we nobody ever thought recently would think of. But the reality is you have evolution going in all directions at all time, you know, and this is an example of that. Okay. So the, so Tiktaalik became us, but Kikiktanya just went right back, and we're not directly descended from it. Exactly. You keep that land stuff. I'm going back in a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so for Tiktaalik, I mean, this is a, a m many millions of years process, or hundred thousands of years process for it to 
become situated to land. But do you imagine that the way that this happened is, I mean, one of its earliest, uh, cause this is a continuum here. One of its earliest, uh, relatives transitioning to land, maybe just saw some like plants <laughs> that were sort of hovering just above the water and it tried to like nibble at them and then, or do you have a, a more sophisticated understanding of how this happened than I? I, I was more sophisticated, but here it is. The um, Tiktaalik is really specialized for life in water, most, but it was capable of life on land. It was able to walk in the water bottom, you know, the bottom of the stream or lake. It was able to go into the shallows and support itself there. And it was also able to make excursions in the mudflats, right? So it was, I'd call it partial, mostly aquatic, but partially terrestrial, right? Um, and it was able to feed. It had big jaws and sharp teeth and all that good stuff. And they can get quite big, actually. It could be quite a predatorial form. Um, but I, but it hadn't made the commitment to land yet. It took a long time for that commitment to land to happen. Um, many millions of years, several millions of years. Um, and so the next, you know, kind of descendants of or cousins of Tiktaalik that are more um, terrestrial almost certainly they were spending more time on land doing traverses walk actually walking distances on land but also tethered to the water still so i think what you're seeing for a long period of time is creatures that are still tethered to the water for reproduction and maybe some feeding but are taking ever but are specializing ever more to 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 being more terrestrial that is spending more time in terrestrial environments covering more distance in terrestrial environments maybe finding new food sources in terrestrial environments, but still returning to the water to breed, um, hmm. things like that. So, I mean, so what you have is sort of the amphibious lifestyle coming about. Tiktaalik being more on the fish end of the amphibious lifestyle, but then these other limbed animals that appear in the Devonian and somewhat later, um, they're more on the sort of amphibian end of that um, lifestyle. But uh, I guess two two questions. What was it eating? And then you mentioned some of its... Uh, like it's it's hands or it's fins, it's arms yes. and legs. How is it breathing? Had lungs. So uh, that's a, let me just get to lungs in a second. But TikTok almost certainly had lungs. Um, the uh, what was it eating it was almost certainly eating fish and invertebrates because it had big sharp fangs. Kind of anything it wanted. You know, it was pretty. Um, think of a small crocodile kind of critter. It could eat fish. It could eat big invertebrates, and some of those invertebrates at this time were quite big. Um, you know, so it was, a, it was clearly a carnivore. It wasn't an herbivore. Hmm. Herbivory and vertebrates was not a big deal yet. Okay. Um, it was a meat eater. So um, maybe it was it was chasing crabs up into the mud flat, something like well, that. Well, probably could be chasing invertebrates, big invertebrates in there, certainly. Or it could be eating fish still in water, or both. More likely both. Um, but the other thing about lungs is here's the thing. So if you think lungs came about at the transition from life in water to life on land, if you think feathers came about as creatures evolved to fly, you'd be in really, really good company, but you'd also be entirely wrong. We've known it for over a century. Lungs are actually deeply primitive. They evolved eons before creatures took their first steps on land. What you see are lungfish of different kinds, um, deeper in the evolutionary tree. Lungs originally arose not to support life on land, but as accessory organs to breathe when the oxygen content of water drops, much like lungfish today. Lungfish today, and there's other species that we don't call lungfish, like a creature called polypterus. Um, these creatures have lungs, <clears throat> but they use them when the, and they have gills, both lungs and gills. And they use them when the oxygen content of water gets really low. So they use the gills when oxygen content's high, gets low, they'd go up to the surface, take gulps, come back down. So lungs didn't evolve at the transition. They evolved well before the transition, and creatures that were living in, uh, you know, oxygen areas, environments that had variable concentrations of oxygen through the through the year, um, and that's an important principle. That many of the great transitions rely on inventions that were actually ancient; they already existed. That is, the origin of limbed animals and you know land living animals didn't really require a ton of new inventions. Yes, there were some, no doubt about it. But a lot of the inventions that they needed to make those first steps actually arose in aquatic fish living in aquatic organisms in an aquatic environment. You know, um, elbows, <coughs> wrists, necks, shoulders, lungs, all this stuff arose. They're already there in these creatures 
before they ever took their first steps on land. So that when the environment changed and plants created this ecosystem that was kind of juicy to, you know, to, to, to go on land, they already had some of the inventions that were necessary to do it. You know, so it was changing a function of what already exists. So basically, you know, when you see these great revolutions of life, the inventions that were necessary to make these great revolutions most often evolve well before the revolution itself in a different context, do something else. And that's a great general principle because that applies to the anatomies we're talking about, like, you know, the bones, but it also applies to the organs, like not the bones, but like uh, lungs physiology, but also applies to genes. Like genes evolve in one context, usually doing make involved in the development of one organ. Then once you have that developmental process, it's like a little subroutine or module that gets turned on somewhere else to make another organ that's different. You know? So the processes, the developmental processes that are used to to make limbs, um, some of those genes are actually we see them in making genitalia and making parts of the um what we call the axial skeleton, the back, and so forth. So genes evolve in one context, then they tend to be repurposed or co-opted, that process, to, to, to operate in another context. So it's, again, repurposing, co-option, changing function, all this stuff. That's the, that's the stuff of revolution in evolution. Hmm. Well, I'm really glad that this came up because I hadn't, I hadn't realized that lungs developed so much earlier than the first forays onto land. That's really interesting. And so is this, this bootstrapping principle is very powerful. You already Super. mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, I mean, fins became our hands. That was bootstrapping. That's right. Exactly. Well, you know, you think about it, and evolution couldn't happen any other way, right? It, otherwise, you'd have to ha evolve so many things independently at the same time for this transition to happen. You'd have to have elbows and wrists and and all and lungs and all this stuff happen evolving independently, but no, that's not how it is. They evolved independently, but not at the same time. They evolved early, it, and it creatures adapting to water, you know, to walk on the water bottom or live in the shallows, so that when the time came, the opportunity came, or the need came to walk on land, that stuff was already mostly there, you know. So, you mentioned a, a few minutes ago that you think land-based vertebrates descend from Tiktaalik, but that they might have arisen uh, from different branchings of the same species. I'm wondering if one way you, or one, yeah, one way you've uh, found yourself at this conclusion is that you see like different bootstrapping procedures and different classes of mammals or vertebrates. I yeah. I mean, think about it this way. Um, if you look at human technologies, the one of the reasons why we have patent law is because people can come up with the same technology independently, either because they find that information, they know something about it, or the time is right, and that just it's the inevitable next step, right? Um, well, if you think about organisms and they have certain genes and developmental processes, you know they they allow certain kinds of pathways of evolution and don't allow others. You know, and so if organisms are sharing a common environment and they have common genes, well, the outcome, the evolutionary outcome may be very simple, even though they're living pretty far apart. See what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you might have the common outcome uh, in that case. And I think that's really important. But the other important thing is Tiktaalik is not the ancestor. It's a cousin of the ancestor because it has some weird traits in it that tells us it's not the actual direct line, but it's a real close cousin, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah. So are you still hunting for that direct line in the same period? The same I'm always period? hunting. Yeah, I'm always, I'm always doing that. So I'm um, right now we're looking for Tiktaalik 2.0, something a little closer to tetrapods. Uh, we're also looking deeper in the tree. That's what we're doing in Antarctica, looking, you know, for Tiktaalik's distant, you know, more ancient relatives. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, what we're also trying to do, and it's this is a little more. It's not as flashy, but it's every, but it's really important is to really understand the ecosystems where all this has happened. So that means collecting all the other species, you know, understanding the geology and the setting, the ecological setting, understanding a little bit about, you know, uh, the trophic relationships, who ate who, you know? Um, uh, yeah, all that stuff, you know? And um, 
you know, that's the hard work of doing, that's kind of the hard work of field work. I mean, it was hard work to find Tiktaalik, but once, you know, you have that, you really kind of want to understand what the rest of the ecosystem's like. And so that's what we've been doing. You know, after we found Tiktaalik, we returned to those sites a number of years. In fact, we tried to get back last year. And it fell through, but um, <clears throat> um, we'll go back this coming summer. Um, uh, but, you know, trying to find more species. We have about 18 other species that lived with Tiktaalik in the same stream, same Devonian stream. So it was a pretty thriving ecosystem. Um, yeah. So, yeah, speaking of Devonian streams and really trying to understand the ecosystem, what was Tiktaalik's relationship to freshwater and saltwater? And Don't know. Were... Sorry? It's a good question. We don't know. Oh. Okay. So we find tectonic in what we think are freshwater sediments. We know that we, we, we estimate that from the plants. We estimate that from some of the geology of the rocks, although that can get a little dicey, but really it's the plants that they're with. Um, and also the geography of where we are in the basin, the ancient basin, that's just our stuff, which tells us that it's almost certainly freshwater. Um, but there are other relatives of tectonic that have been discovered over the years that live more in the marine end of things more in the near shore or the estuary or the tidal flat kind of area. So what we think is, well, Tiktaalik is fresh water, um, but some of its close relatives, a little more ancient relatives were salt water uh, or had some, you know, some mix fresh and salt um, that probably these creatures were moving back and forth from the, um, from the near shore environment into the freshwater ecosystem. And, you know, we know, Creatures that do that today, obviously, salmon and things like that. So, you know, so there probably was some salt tolerance in these creatures. And that probably explains why they're able to, while we find them around 